Also, good morning. I know that it's early, and uh, I was told last night that AppSec California likes to party. So I appreciate the number of people that actually did show up. I know there are a couple of people a little blurry-eyed, a few people wearing sunglasses. It's all good. But <laughs> I, I, you know, this hopefully this talk will get the blood flowing a little bit. But actually, just to give you just a, a high-level overview of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, is actually just want to take a step back to some of the fundamentals when it comes to application security that often people either forget or try to skip over. So part of this talk that you motivated by, by some of my own personal background, things that I'm interested in. And one of the things I try to do, especially as a quote unquote security executive, so I can put on the you know, thought leader cap or whatever, is try to figure out ways to make security meaningful to other people, especially people that don't work in security on a day-to-day -day basis. So by a show of hands, how many people here are on an application security team? No. Oh. Awesome. How many people here are on an application security team that's bigger than five people? Um, e even better. I mean, it's obviously a much smaller show of hands. And part of the reason actually I wanted to call that out is just because of some of the other things I'm going to be talking about later on in my talk with regards to how to truly make AppSec work. And what I describe is actually building that AppSec muscle. Uh, another show of hands, because I, you know, you have the advantage that you get to actually learn a lot about me. I actually want to learn a little bit about you. How many people here are power lifters? Awesome. <laughs> so some of you actually know who Mark Ripto is. Um, just a little bit of preamble here, because as I mentioned, I know that some of you may have been partying last night. So even if you can't stay awake for the rest of this talk, I always try to present the last slide first. And these are actually the things I really want you to take to heart and actually you know, really take away from this talk. Very first thing is this whole notion of when you're actually working with AppSec and building an AppSec program is to start small with your program. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, another big thing, especially that some of you that are powerlifters, you will already know this phrase, which is that specificity plus frequency of practice is the key to success. And this is probably one of the things that people often forget about when it comes to AppSec and running a good program. The other big thing is you want to measure everything. Getting data is super easy, and the more you can measure, the easier it's going to be for you to, one, demonstrate to yourself if you're being effective, also brought, buy, get buy-in from other people into your program. Um, another big hiccup that I see with a lot of people uh, is not recognizing that they're not Ronnie Coleman. And if you don't know who Ronnie Coleman is, I I'll tell you about him later. But a program that works for somebody that's super advanced is not necessarily the same program that is going to work for you as you're building out your security um, program or as your company is growing, et cetera, especially at a smaller startup. And then the final one is that everyone can do this. So I've already seen a number of hands from people that are already in AppSec. How many people here are just developers? Excellent, excellent. I definitely want to talk to you. Or just don't work in development at all, but you're just part of a company that cares about security. I really want to emphasize this idea that this is something that everybody can do. So uh, I had a brief introduction. Just wanted to say hi. I'm Flea. It is perfectly fine to call me Flea. Uh, everybody except for my mother calls me that. So it's always weird when I get the intro that says Frederick Lee, the government name. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like in all these talks, you always see this where people are like, hey, I did some security stuff, so I have to give you the, you know, the standard, hey, here's a bunch of logos at companies you may have heard of that I used to work at, and I did some security stuff there. The more interesting thing, though, in bringing it back to the whole powerlifting thing, is this is actually one of my favorite quotes, and I like this quote for security purposes, not for powerlifting purposes. What we're trying to do is get things fixed not allow things to stay broke. And this is one of the key aspects of what it means to be a security practitioner. Our job is to get things fixed. So going back to the backstory, and since it is you know, January, and this is the time that everybody has their New Year's resolutions, and probably one of the more common New Year's resolutions is this idea of, it's like, oh, I'm gonna get fit, I'm gonna lose some weight, or I'm gonna run a marathon, or all these other kind of things. So, well, so full disclosure, back in 2008, I did make a fitness resolution. And my resolution was I wanted to join the Thousand Pound Club. How many people here know what the Thousand Pound Club is? Awesome. <laughs> well, I I'll explain that to you. So the Thousand Pound Club is kind of like this phrase in powerlifting, this, this whole notion about these three key lifts inside of powerlifting, which is the deadlift, squat, 
bench press, or just press in general. And those three lifts, your total weight that you lift from there combined equals a thousand pounds or more. So for example, if my bench press is 250, um, my squat is 350, and you know my deadlift is 400, bam, I I've hit the thousand pound club. And it's a good measure, at least for a power lifter, to say, hey, I actually kind of know what I'm doing now. And I'm actually ready to really start taking on some things that are truly advanced. Now, when you're trying to say, hey, I want a resolution and I want to actually you know, shoot for the stars, you automatically think, well, who do I go to for guidance? So there's Ronnie Coleman. He's like eight time you know, Mr. Olympia, like one of probably the most famous bodybuilders outside of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, as it turns out, I am not Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> Ronnie Coleman has been lifting for you know, decades and probably also been utilizing some additional enhancements that I just am not going to do. And at that time, definitely was not ready to do. So I got my guidance from this gentleman. <laughs> um, so some of you actually network this is actually Mark Ripito, and he is a power and strength conditioning coach from Wichita, Texas. Um, he is probably you know, one of the most uh, referenced individuals when it comes to the art of just strength training in general. And he wrote this book, which is effectively the Bible for people in powerlifting. This whole book called um, Starting Strength. If you want to get the advanced versions, it's, hey, you know, like strength programming, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of the basic fundamentals. And in this book, he only focuses on three lifts. And it's all about how do you get yourself strong in a functional way that can actually go in to propagate into whatever other sports you're into or, or just life in general. So what does this have to do with application security? Um, it has to do with this whole notion, at least in my opinion, that good APSEC is a muscle and it is a muscle that has to be trained and, and continuously practiced, else it atrophies. And a lot of these same philosophies that you would take from the discipline of weightlifting also apply in the application security. So I mentioned like having this New Year's resolution of like, hey, I want to you know, join a thousand pound club and you know, I got to find some role models or some people to actually learn to. That also applies in security as well. So up on the screen is more gratuitous logos, <laughs> but these are all companies you probably have heard of. And these are all companies that I think have really, really, really good application security programs. These are companies I look up to. Um, it's companies that you know, we at Square say, hey, we think these are actually good peers. We want to learn from them, et cetera. But not every single startup is ready to do everything that Netflix does or all the exact same things that Google does. And part of that might just be from a level of sophistication or just resources in general. So I wanna actually just take a step back because I haven't been able to actually find a lot of good resources about, well, what do you do if you're just starting out on your journey towards you know, good AppSec strength? And I was also trying to figure out, well, what would be those, those similar fundamental things that you need to have inside a good AppSec program? And so I kind of actually broke it down, at least things that I think from my experience and from other, uh, other people's experience and peers about things that are just fundamental to a good application security program. So I, I mentioned one of the lifts, uh, which is called a deadlift. Deadlift is like the most basic thing. Even a baby can do that. It's like the very first thing that a baby learns how to do is to squat down and pick something up off the ground. And when it comes to application security, we have something that's similar to that. It's just a code review. And this is like the very most fundamental thing that everybody learns inside of not just security, but development in, gen in general. How do I actually read code, understand what it does, right? And this is like the foundation of good AppSec by itself. Um, another great foundational component of AppSec, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, is just secure code training. And to me, this is almost like equivalent of a squat. So like squats, there's multiple variations. It's one of the things you can actually do forever, even if you have some kind of condition or anything like that. I feel like secure code training is the same. Like, so secure code training I would give to a C++ developer is gonna be different than the secure code training I'd give to a Go developer or a Java developer, et cetera. So that variation is actually necessary there and the ability to actually be flexible is necessary as well. Um, the last one is threat modeling, which I still feel like we don't pay enough attention to, <laughs> but I think a lot of people might be doing threat modeling and just calling it a different name. And even if you want to actually be broad with your definition of a threat model and just say, hey, I do design reviews, or you know, we talked about this in the hall, or what feature is being built, et cetera, you can kind of squint and says that actually counts as a threat model. 
So, you know, I kind of actually had this idea of what those three fundamental lifts were in AppSec. And then I was like, well, what would it be like to have a thousand pound club in AppSec? And what I mean by that is, what are those things you would want to see in an AppSec program to say, hey, this AppSec program is Oh, it's actually pretty decent. I mean, it's definitely still some room to grow, but now we know that these people know what they're doing and we're actually on a healthy path. Um, so when I was thinking about some of these AppSec benchmarks and things like that, the very first one I thought was like, hey, like I said, that fundamental code review and what are the things you would actually want to see done well inside of an AppSec program at a bare minimum before they graduate to this thousand pound club. So one is that all security critical code is reviewed prior to deployment. So notice there's actually a nuance in there. I said security critical. And part of the reason I actually wanted to add that nuance there is that a lot of people don't have the resources to review every single piece of code inside the infrastructure. So like, for example, my background, back in my day, back in my day, uh, when I was at Bank of America, Bank of America, we wrote a ton of software. And our initial AppSec team was composed of three people. So for three people to actually go through several million lines of code, including legacy code like COBOL, et cetera, was not going to be something that was practical. So we had to figure out, well, what are the things that were actually critical from a security standpoint inside of Bank of America that we could start targeting to make sure at a minimum that we had some basic good coverage across the board. Some of those you know, things, and this is not an exhaustive list of being like, hey, everybody knows you don't want to check out your authorization and authentication code. You want to make sure that people are actually using crypto wisely um, you also want to make sure that there's some basic sanitization around user input output. These are just all just you know fundamental things. Um, the other you know area that I think actually is an indication of a good AppSec program is what people actually do around developer training. Um, for me, at a minimum, all developers need to receive language specific training at least on an annual basis. And I, I want to emphasize that language specific training because a key way to lose developers is that you give them training in something that's completely outside their realm, something they don't care about, et cetera. And this is a mistake I've made in the past myself, is not knowing the audience. So for example, you go to a bunch of people working on firmware and their day is spent in just low level C and assembly and you want to talk to them about the OWASP top 10. No offense. I love OWASP, <laughs> but they're going to be more concerned about things like buffer overflows and a whole other set of class of vulnerabilities as opposed to just cross-site scripting, SQL injection, et cetera. And once you start giving them that kind of training, their eyes are going to gloss over and they're going to say, hey, this is worthless. I'm not coming back to this again. Um, another good thing to actually have inside that program is training that actually leverages existing vulnerabilities inside the code. Peep, that resonates so much better with developers than almost anything else you can get. In regards to just pulling some things that are down that are generic, that's somewhat useful. But if it's code that they've seen before and they recognize, that immediately gets embedded in, into their personality. Um, the other thing I think I like to see inside of good developer training is this notion of actually emphasizing the right way to do things as opposed to just pointing out, hey, this is what SQL injection looks like. Yeah, that, that's great. But did you teach somebody how to do you know, proper parameterized queries, um, input, output, sanitization, et cetera? Just showing the wrong way to do things is not as effective as actually showing people the proper way. We learn better by following good examples as opposed to bad examples. Um, like I said, the training needs to also be annually. And then finally, this is actually a bonus. Uh, that training is even better if the developers actually like it. <laughs> I know there are a couple of laughs. Does anybody have training that their developers like? Awesome. No, no, it's kudos, kudos. We need to get more of that going around. Um, last on the list of just kind of like that benchmarking criteria for a good AppSec program is threat modeling. Um, and as I said, like these are kind of like bare minimum criteria. That's what you want to say, you know, have this notion of thousand pound club, things you need to have at a minimum in a good AppSec program. That's all new significant features receive a design review. And part of the reason why I say all new is kind of going back to that idea of scoping as you're starting out a program. If you work for a large organization, there's no way you can actually go through and do a threat model and design review of every single product that's ever shipped but you can do design reviews on new features that are shipping. And that's an easy way for you to actually get involved, get integrated, et cetera. Um, the other thing on these design reviews is that these should be developer-led. 
So you should be there essentially as a coach slash assistant, because once again, it's gonna be an issue of scaling if the developers aren't directly involved. And also for better, well, not for better or worse, um, <laughs> the developers is gonna know way more about their software and their intentions than you do. And it's a great way also to get developer buy-in for security, et cetera. Another big thing is that these design reviews actually should be documented. Um, and, and I've been guilty of this in the past myself, where the design review itself, like, hey, we had a conversation in the hallway. Yep, I think we're all on the same page, but nobody actually wrote it down. So five years later, we don't know why that decision was made. Sometimes when we're thinking, thinking about threat modeling and mitigations, we're gonna make some compromises. We're gonna say, hey, we think this is an acceptable risk or this is within our tolerance. We think we have other compensating controls, but if nobody writes it down, it's almost worthless. And then finally, as I mentioned, you also want to make sure that, hey, we've actually found a bunch of risk. Well, you should probably plan some mitigations around that. So, you know, I talked a little bit about benchmarking, but how do we really start getting started on some of these things? And going back to some of these fundamentals about how do you have a good AppSec program, especially as you're just growing it from the start, you know, like that one, two, or even five person security team. The area I see a lot of people struggle with is they try to effectively boil the ocean. They want to find and solve for every single vulnerability out there, whether or not it's actually what they identify as being a high or a low risk. That often is too much for one team to actually bite off and chew and, and handle. And I think a healthier path is to kind of actually try to find a handful of vulnerabilities that are really impactful for your organization that you really care about and focusing on those, effectively starting small and growing you know, along with your team slash the company, et cetera. It's amazing what a impact you can make by just looking at a handful of vulnerabilities, even more so if you can you know, tune your team, uh, your time, et cetera, to try to eliminate classes of vulnerabilities and then start moving on towards something else. So for example, you might wanna say, hey, we are a, you know, cat picture web app shop. And you say, hey, you know, the thing we care about the most is we wanna make sure that there's no cross-site scripting, right? And so he's like, hey, there's all kinds of other things that we might be worried about, but let's focus on cross-site scripting first, eliminate that, and then move on to some of the things that are a little bit more, um, more nuanced or not necessarily as impactful to the business. One of the things that I've actually seen in practice also is that Areas that you essentially have always considered weak or things you didn't pay attention to previously are often the areas you can actually improve the most. And going back to some of those, you know, lifting analogies, this is one of those things we actually call beginner gains. Almost anything you do is going to have a significant impact and improvement for you. Other big thing is this notion of quote unquote checking your form. So in lifting is actually really important, not just to you know, try to continuously progress, but also progress in a refined, safe way, making sure you're, you're doing everything properly. Like if you have checklists or those kind of things, you can consider it something similar to that. I Meaning you're actually following the exact same routine every single time, getting the exact same you know, result. So when I say, you know, kind of like check your form, like one of the things I do call out is I do think it's actually important to actually kind of once again, focus on those critical areas. Like what are the things that are actually most important to your business? Which development groups are maybe historically having the most problems? How can you actually go deeper into that? Get them up level, et cetera. Um, also, if you are on a small team, yeah, you really wanna do is like, where can we actually have the biggest bang for our buck? Best, best return on investment, et cetera. Another area that I've seen developers and, and well, actually more so AppSec people actually struggle with is not fully understanding the language or frameworks that they're dealing with. And one of the issues there, that can often cause a loss of confidence from the teams you're supporting. So for example, if I am a you know, Java nerd, which, which I am, <laughs> and I'm trying to actually support a bunch of you know, Rails developers and I don't actually know Rails, I can end up giving them effectively dumb advice. And they're gonna question that advice. And then the next time I come to them with something, they'll say like, man, Flea didn't really know what he was talking about last time. I'm not sure I really trust him this time. So it's actually really important that you learn to speak the same language as the developers. And if you don't know the framework, ask the developers. 
I mean, they can tell you about, you know, hey, this framework does escaping like this, this is already built in, et cetera. Things that, you know, maybe you didn't already know, but it also helps build that relationship and make that relationship stronger as well. Um, and that actually goes to kind of like that last, uh, you know, analogy, quote unquote, getting a spot. Somebody to actually help you check that you're actually doing the right thing and progressing security in a safe and sane way. And that's literally most of the time going to be the developers that actually own that code. They know the code better than any of us are gonna know the code. And I think that also is gonna get them to be bought into writing more secure code in the future as well. Uh, so, you know, like, and, and for those of you that are power lifters, you'll, you'll be upset about seeing this. <laughs> there actually is a place for having machines and automation, et cetera, like that to help you grow and progress the program. So I think automation really comes into play when you're actually looking to scale, but it's not the first place you should start. You shouldn't start on day one saying, hey, I just bought a bunch of tools. I'm gonna to start using this machine here, you know, X, Y, and Z. You really wanna nail those fundamentals first. So you can actually understand what your problems are and where you should be targeting those machines or, or scaling, you know, um, apparatus later. You know, full disclosure, I used to work at Fortify, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of static analysis. Um, and that is one of those tools, but static analysis is not the first tool you should start with. Static analysis is something you add in after you already have a good understanding of how to do code reviews, how to do AppSec, et cetera, because you want to be able to actually figure out what is, what, what is it I'm actually looking for, as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm gonna have this machine, it's just gonna dump out a bunch of you know, stuff to me, and we're gonna kind of pick through it and try to decide what is valuable. You'll end up probably wasting some time if that's the way you actually do that. And this kind of goes back to the notion that automation machines, et cetera, that's actually supposed to supplement a human, not replace a human. And sorry for the vendors in the room that might disagree with that. <laughs> no, but it's, it's just something that can help you scale because without that additional understanding, the tool itself isn't extremely valuable. Um, and then finally, you definitely wanna make sure that you're keeping an eye on what the purpose of the tool is you're using. The whole idea behind application security is to help people actually understand and manage risk. It's not just to actually turn out vulnerabilities or turn out you know, reports for people to read, et cetera. Um, you know, I mentioned some of the mistakes that people kind of make when they're going out actually building these security teams or running AppSec, et cetera. Uh, and, and this is, especially for those of you, like I said, are powerless in the room, you already know this, every day is leg day. And what I mean is there's actually some key fundamental things that should be mandatory that you do all the time, whether or not you wake up tired, whether or not the developer is complaining about it, et cetera, it's just so valuable to good security that it should be part of everybody's program and done routinely every single time. For me, code reviews, that's, that's leg day for me. It's like I've never run into an instance where a code review was not valuable for the product. I mean, it may not be actually the quickest thing that we could actually do, but I think it always returns the most value and most understanding. It is one of those few areas that I do believe you should make mandatory within your organization. Now, when I say it should be mandatory, it doesn't necessarily mean that a security team needs to perform the code review. Code reviews can often be performed by developers in a lot of organizations. I would actually say the majority of organizations already do that, right? You know, like, it's like, hey, you know, I just had a pull request, somebody else needs to actually review that and they need to approve it, et cetera. Um, to augment that though, I would ask that the application security team actually talks to developers like, hey, here's some security things you should also be looking for, or try to get involved in those code reviews as well. So, you know, one of the other things that you actually want to do as you're building out this program, trying to mature it, is you actually really want to measure and record your progress. You know, it's the classic managerial quote, you can't manage what you don't measure. So you don't know if you're actually being successful if you have no metrics behind it. And fortunately, because we're using computers, all this data is so easy and free for us to get. Some of my favorite things for people to just, you know, log and measure is, hey, what are common vulns that we actually just found overall, right? What are some of the common vulnerabilities that are for a specific team? Is there a common set of vulnerabilities uh, you know, for this particular project. These are all meaningful things, even if you don't act upon them immediately. Uh, one of the ways to utilize that data though, is say, hey, we know that 
this team here has a problem with SQL injection. So let's have targeted training for SQL injection on this team. Or we can say, hey, we're finding all these things. Let's tune our tools or tune our practices so it makes it even easier for us to actually find these uh, classes of vulnerabilities. Another big thing I like to see in programs is to make it visible. All, these, all this data, all these metrics, et cetera, make it visible not just to the security team, but to the developers and those developers, you know, uh, bosses, managers, et cetera. There's this, uh, there's this old Arnold Schwarzenegger parable that I actually I like to use called showing your calves. And the reason why I say that is like he had this notion that his calves were underdeveloped and the way to make him or force himself to develop his calves better was to effectively show the world, it's like, hey, I have, I have small calves. And I think there is, that's actually applicable inside of application security as well, because I've seen developers change behavior because it's now public that they say, this team here is producing these kind of vulns and they kind of have a history of that. It's not necessarily in a negative light, it's effectively just helping people hold themselves accountable because oftentimes they may not even know themselves. Um, full disclosure, I do kind of think CrossFit is a pyramid scheme but there is an aspect of the CrossFit pyramid scheme that I like. Uh, and for those of you that aren't aware of the, the pyramid scheme joke, oftentimes people start training CrossFit and then you start paying money so you can actually become a trainer in CrossFit. So then you can actually start training other people to become trainers in CrossFit, thus expanding your money. Um, but what I like about that model though, in general, especially when it comes to application security, is this notion of getting developers to be bought in and effectively converting your developers into additional members of your application security team. Have them start doing the code reviews. Have the developers themselves start doing the threat modeling. Have the developers also start doing security training. And that latter is extremely powerful because they're working right alongside all the rest of their teammates. They know all the issues. They know the legacy code as well. And they can actually come up with some really, really specific training that helps their team execute quickly while also executing safely. And I think that's a, another really, really good way to help scale that team. And it's kind of like this notion of moving that AppSec team, not just from being the ex, you know, people actually executing the, the plan, but effectively the coaches. And I think that coaching model is a much better model than the you know, security team as police or security team as bodyguards only model. So you know, one of the things that also comes up when people talk about like training and weightlifting, and this is definitely something if you read uh, Mark Ripto's uh, books, everybody wants to say, oh, I want to get bigger arms. I want to be, you know, look like Arnold or you know, Ronnie, et cetera. Um, those aren't things that you should focus on immediately, but those are benefits you can actually come across you know, later, and even more so you can actually start refining your program to do some of these extra things to you know, get, get some of that additional benefits you would actually like to have. Uh, the reason why I don't know, think it has to be the immediate focus is a lot of these same advantages that you would get from some of the you know, more tuned programs, uh, tweaking things, et cetera, you're gonna get from just focusing on those basic foundational things. And that's actually where it comes back to the you know, powerlifting analogy as well. If you're doing a lot of deadlifting, you're gonna actually get bigger arms by default. So you know, like one of the things I do call out though, especially for those that you know, are using static analysis, is once your program is starting to get advanced, that's the time where you really want to dive in and really start tuning your static analysis. Even more so if you can actually start tuning it to find non-security um, issues. So I found a powerful way to get developers to buy into static analysis is by helping them find things that they've always cared about. It's like, hey, I don't like to see this function called in, you know, in this particular manner. That's actually something that stack analysis is really good at finding, and it's not something that's just security specific. So essentially, you get the developers motivated and engaged and wanting to actually use the tools also themselves. You also want to leverage that automation to look for areas to reinforce the good practices that you want. So I, I'm really excited about a lot of uh, tools that are coming out now that essentially are pushing developers towards the quote unquote preferred behavior as opposed to just pointing out problems. Uh, the last one is actually, uh, we can actually talk about this later because <laughs> this is still one of, one of my favorites. Uh, I am a little bit biased towards this. I think one of the more powerful things you can do inside of AppSec is help build 
or help teams use secure frameworks and components and services by, by default. So you effectively just start eliminating classes of vulnerabilities by making your code, it, it's just not relevant to your code anymore. It's just handled automatically. So we've talked kind of like at a super, super, super high level about some of the good things I like to see inside of application security programs. What I think some of those fundamental aspects slash benchmarks should be for a good AppSec program. But there are some areas that people trip up on. Um, the most common area I see people trip up on is this notion of just taking on too much. Um, you know, the classic example is an AppSec team gets started and they immediately trying to review all the code inside of an organization. And that's just a recipe for failure. Like one, you're just not gonna be able to focus on the things that are critical. Um, you might also burn your team out. <laughs> um, but it's just, you won't have enough time and resources to be successful. Uh, the other thing is I find that people will often get hung up on effectively vulns that don't matter. Hear me out. <laughs> All vulns matter. Some vulns matter more than others. Um, and, 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 and I say that partially tongue in cheek, but it is, it's an area we know that, yep, if I look at enough, well, not to pick on PHP too much, but if you look at enough PHP code, yeah, I mean, you're gonna have vulns for days, right? And especially some things that actually that affect, you know, legacy code, et cetera. But that also means you're gonna focus just on all these kind of like really, really low risk issues. You're gonna miss out on high risk issues in other projects because you're, you know, too, too stuck in this mountain of, oh, well, low risk bad. <laughs> Um, the other thing is that I think a lot of people try to go from, hey, I'm a one person security team to, hey, I'm Netflix in a year. Um, no offense, <laughs> you're probably not going to do that. And, and, and you know, it's not necessarily just a bad thing, but you have to remember that Netflix, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, they've been working on their security program for years. They have been, you know, building out and training their professionals, training their, training their developers, et cetera, for a really, really long time. And it's an unrealistic target for yourself to try to set that goal. Also, this can undermine your credibility with the rest of the organization. So if you're telling the rest of the organization, like, hey, we're gonna do everything that Google does, and you're a two-person team, uh, that's just a recipe for a disaster, and it's gonna make you quickly lose credibility with the people that are effectively funding you and supporting you. We, we talked about form a little bit earlier, this notion of having good form. And I also want to just talk about, you know, some specific things that I call out as quote unquote bad form inside of application security. Um, number one is not getting developer buy-in. And, and I, I would say it's also number one might actually be a tie about not having developers on your security team. You have to speak the language of developers in order to get cooperation from developers. And that also means understanding some of their pressures and concerns. So recognizing that oftentimes developers are only incentivized to ship features, not necessarily to fix things. And so you have to be aware of that and effectively have what I call empathy for the developer. Um, the other big thing, and, and this is super common, is generic secure development training. Security, <laughs> security training, especially secure development training, is probably one of my biggest pet peeves. I'm super sensitive towards it. I have seen so much bad secure development training, and it's mostly bad because it's just generic. And you know, you always have developers say, "Hey, you want me to give up like eight hours or two days or even sometimes a week to go to this training that's not relevant to me?" And you might be able to do that once, but you won't get developers to go to that training ever again. Um, and then the final one on the bad form side is <laughs> untuned tool usage. It's like literally, hey, I bought something, I heard really great reviews about it, but I didn't touch it and I just turned it on, let it run, and I was expecting great things out of it. And, and I haven't found a security tool that works like that yet. I'm, I'm more than happy to actually find one. So if you're a vendor and you know like, hey, my product doesn't need to be tuned or configured or anything at all, come talk to me. <laughs> um, the other, uh, like I guess the final major pitfall category is essentially trying to have shortcuts. As it turns out, there's no quick way to having a great AppSec program. There's no quick way to having, you know, 
a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Ronnie Coleman, et cetera. It's just, there aren't any silver bullets yet. There's a lot of really, really promising products out there, a lot of great things coming out on the market, but I haven't found one yet that can just say, hey, all your application security needs are now just solved and handled. Um, another major pitfall I see is AppSec teams just saying, hey, we don't want to document anything. We don't measure, we don't write things down. We just go, we file vulns, uh, we put stuff in JIRA for people, and then that's it. You really do need to actually write these things down so people can go back later and examine it, and also to hold yourself and the team accountable for what's going on. Um, going back to the tools, it's just kind of like this over-reliance of tools as well. I've been into a number of organizations that is like, hey, I, and yeah, hey, I bought a copy of Fortify, and that's all we need. Now we have AppSec going, and you know we've never learned to tune it. We haven't done anything else. We've never done a manual code review because we think this is enough. Like I said, I, I'm not, not a huge fan of just saying fire and forget on those. And then finally, and I will confess of also being guilty of this, especially in my youth, is essentially utilizing FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt to try to get developers in the organization motivated to do things. And the reason why this is so bad is that it undermines your credibility and developers won't listen to you in the future. You really do want to get that developer buy-in because that's gonna be your best ally and effectively the primary source for getting security to run and work well. So I know I talked about like these three major categories and it's not because I hate everything else inside of AppSec. I just feel like those three categories are the fundamental things. You know, this whole notion of, you know, code reviews, uh, security training and threat modeling, those are kind of like the, the fundamental things. Um, there are other areas that should be included in an AppSec program, but those aren't necessarily the things that have to be included on day one. I like pen testing. I buy pen tests from other firms, you know, et cetera. It's something that I want to see in more advanced programs. Um, I think there's a lot of promise for, you know, well, at least especially next, quote unquote, next generation WAFs, et cetera. I think that's a really, really promising field as well, but it may not be the thing you need on day zero. Um, you know, RAFs, et cetera, these are all great things, but they aren't necessarily critical to starting an AppSec program. So before we, you know, jump back, you know, and, and maybe talk, take some questions or anything like that, I did want to actually just kind of reflect a little bit on some of the things we covered. It's like, once again, you really want to make sure you're starting small with your program. You want to make sure that you have room to grow and that you're actually being effective on day zero or, or day, you know, 10, as opposed to waiting to be effective on day 720. Um, this whole notion of these mandatory activities there's this concept of in a moment of crisis, you always fall back on the thing that you've practiced the most. So there's, you know, you really do want to emphasize, you know, doing this practice, doing it with some, some kind of specificity, the frequency, adding all those things together, it's what's going to truly make you successful. You want to measure everything. There's no such thing as, you know, cloud storage, et cetera. There's all, all kinds of, you know, abilities to store things effectively for free. So why not actually try to store all of that and measure it and reflect on it later? Um, also make sure that you're picking the right quote unquote program or process for your team and company at the time. You can't be Google, you can't be Netflix on day one. Um, and then finally, every single person can do this. In fact, your company doesn't necessarily have to have a dedicated AppSec team to have a decent AppSec program when it's starting. All the activities that I actually talked about and listed previously are all things that developers can actually do themselves. And in fact, I think there might be a lot of benefit to having developers actually start leading that charge first. So I wanna wrap things up uh, before questions and uh, with, this final quote is actually one of my favorite Mark Ripto quotes. It's a uh, strong people are harder to kill than weak people and more useful in general. Um, and I just kind of X that out and say uh, uh, security programs instead of people, because having a strong security program is one of those fundamental things that's gonna allow your company to really accelerate what they're doing and to do so safely and ideally uh, help a lot of you sleep easier at night. So with that said, uh, that is it for my talk, um, but I'm more than happy to actually take any questions. I'm pretty sure we have a little bit of time left. Hello, 
So I, I perform the secure development training at my company, so I feel a little bit called out right now. Um, <laughs> how on earth do you scale like code and framework specific engineering trainings when you have a million tech stacks and like a million different kinds of engineers? Yep, uh, and, and I think a lot of, I love that question and, and actually I think everybody heard it because it was Mike. Uh, <laughs> That's where I really do like to see developers actually brought in. And one of the things you'll see later, like if there was a phase two for this program, how to go from having a you know beginner AppSec program to a medium AppSec program, et cetera, um, security champions. It's getting those people in the development teams that know the language, care about it, and it's actually fairly easy to find those individuals. You can do that by one, having your secure development training and testing people after it. And taking those people that tested really well, it's like, hey, have you ever thought about helping out with security? Do you care about this? Can you help you know, lend us a hand? Can you also make this better so you don't have to take crappy training next year? Not saying that your training was crappy, but no, just make it so it's more engaging. <laughs> no, so that, that, that's actually one way. There are also some companies out there that are trying to do much better by having some really, really specific application uh, you know, and framework specific training along those lines. Um, I'm more than happy to actually talk to you afterwards. I can, I can give you a name of a couple of you know ones I think do a really good job of that. Um, there are some interesting products that are kind of out there that are also trying to do that as well. Like I don't want to, yeah, I won't, I won't do any uh, vendor plugs or anything like that. Um, but there's definitely help out there. But probably the best help is the developers themselves. So for Agile and Scrum teams, how do you integrate with them? Oh, how do you integrate with that? Um, I, I, for Agile and Scrum teams, I don't think there's anything that I've mentioned here that doesn't work in their existing workflow. It's like most Agile development uh, teams are already doing code reviews. As I mentioned, you know, the common practice, especially since everybody, you know, most people, I guess, now are using Git, et cetera, is like, hey, I just, you know, issued a pull. Can somebody else review this and actually put, you know, and effectively say, is this secure? Does it actually meet our standards? That kind of thing. I think most of these things can just easily flow into agile methodologies. Um, if you are familiar with the rugged security, uh, um, which is an OWASP project, that project itself actually has a lot of good tips about how to integrate into agile as well. Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, so in general, I think a lot of times for smaller companies, I, I will see that brought up about using security champions to scale your program. And then, but you also talked about how like measuring everything is important. And having tried to do a security champions program in the past, I've run into a lot of challenges of like, what are you trying to measure and how do you measure the success of a security champions program? So I'd be curious if you've found sort of successful ways of doing that. Yep, and, and, and so some of it actually just varies by company. Um, one super simple way to start when you're measuring quote unquote the effective security champion programs is f measuring the number of security champions you have. Like that initial criteria is generally gonna be, do I have a security champion on every scrum team, product team, et cetera. Essentially somebody who thinks security is part of my job or I'm the primary person who wants to think about security for that or th that's one simple metric. Um, the other is you can also start measuring things like, hey, a classic thing you have for security champion do is effectively kind of like own vulnerability management for their team. You can say like, hey, how quickly is this security champion getting vulnerabilities closed? I mean, are they actually meeting their SLAs, et cetera? There's a lot of various things you can actually do and utilize with security champions. It is, it's not an easy problem. Um, so, so I'm not, don't, don't want to dismiss your question at all, but I think those are actually some really simple things that, that can be measured. Depending on how you've built up your security champion program, if they're, Essentially, if your security champions are volunteers, you want to be a lot more lenient with them. If your security champions are like, hey, this is part of your job, you're getting paid extra for this, et cetera, then you do want to actually ratchet up some of the criteria and you really want to start holding them accountable to some of those things. Like, saying, hey, are you making sure your team is doing code reviews? Are you making sure your team is doing like some of those, you know, various security checklists, um, those kind of things. So. Yep, so. If that is it for questions, I will be around a little bit more today. So appreciate all y'all coming out.